Okay, great. So I'm going to share a few words on this. Um, when I was looking at this passage, I thought to myself, uh, what an amazing passage of scripture. It's, it's perfect for this time, Palm Sunday, and certainly for this time of Easter. And even more so for this time with this pandemic that we're going through right now. Um, and I think there's a few lessons in here that we can, we can glean, some things that we can take away. And so I want to share with you a few points. I really enjoyed listening to Sam, uh, first of all, Tunde a few weeks ago, and then Sam, and then last week, Aaron. That was a great message. Um, they were all great messages. And of course, you can go back and listen to those on SoundCloud if you'd like to. Now, what I'd like to do is take a few lines from some of the things that Paul had to say and some of the things that happened in this story. Now, the scene is set. You can see that from verse 10, um, Paul um, has an opportunity to bring his defense before Felix. And you know that Paul is quite a forthright character. Um, He can speak for himself. He can speak up. And you know that he believes fervently in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He believes in the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And despite the fact that he's in front of the authorities, he's going to let them know in no uncertain uh, way that, you know, Jesus is real, that God is real, <clears throat> that salvation is real. And he speaks, first of all, in verse... Uh, verse 14 um, I'm just going to pick up on a few lines so the first one I'll pick up is from verse 14 Paul's three part confession and when you think of what Paul uh, when we break down what Paul is actually saying here but I admit that I follow the way I follow the way you know the church before it was known as the church it was known as the way Um, it was the way um, you know Jesus said I am the way I am the truth and I am the life and the Christianity was known as the way. It was the way that it was described by the believers and also those outside of the church who knew about it described it as the way because it was a way of life. It was a culture. It was, well, they described it here as a cult, but it was a new pattern, a new method of living. And when we come to Jesus, we come into the way. We come into this new pattern, this new method of living. It's not the way of the world. It's the way of Christ. And so, uh, Paul admits freely, yeah, I've got to tell you the truth. I am a follower of the way, which these men call a cult. We acknowledge even today that we are Christians, we are believers, we are members of the church. We call it the way, we call it the church, we call it Christianity, but the world calls it something else. They might view us as cultish. They might view this as some cult. They may not see the value of what we do or the necessity of what we do or the importance of what we do. But we know that there's a difference between what they believe and what they call it and what we call it. They may call it a cult, but we call it the way. We're following Jesus. He said, point number two in his three-part confession, his three-fold confession, I worship the God of our ancestors. And he's really appealing to all the Jews that are present, including this leader here. He's appealing to them that I'm not just following some new fad. I'm not just doing some new thing. But the God who I worship, the way that I follow, is really worshipping the heavenly God, Jehovah, the God of our ancestors. He's invoking uh, memories of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the great men of God, Moses, that lived before. And he's saying... That's the God that I'm worshipping. I'm worshipping the God of our ancestors. And it's the same for us today. We are worshipping the God of our ancestors. Many of our ancestors, wherever they came from, uh, countries on the continent of Africa or countries in the Caribbean or countries around Europe or countries around Asia or wherever they or countries around the Orient, wherever they came from. You know, our forefathers, if you go back far enough in history, you'll find that there is a root of believers there somewhere. And we are following the God of our ancestors ancestors and when we join in worship today we are doing exactly what our grandparents did and exactly what their grandparents did what in times of hardship they they huddled together and they prayed to God and they called on the name of the Lord and they were saved and third part of his confession is I firmly believe the Jewish law and everything written 
in the prophets. Now, when he speaks about the Jewish law, he's speaking about the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, um, and Deuteronomy. He's saying he firmly believes in the Jewish law. And he firmly believes everything written in Isaiah, everything written in Jeremiah, everything written in Micah. He's saying, I'm a firm believer of the Bible. I believe what the Bible says. And what the Bible says is how I try to live my life. And the question for us when we contemporize this, folks, is can we say the same as Paul? Can we really say that we are followers of the way? Not followers of our way, but followers of the way followers of God's way? Are we following Jesus or are we doing our own thing? Do we veer off the road every so often on a Saturday night, on a Wednesday morning, or when we get to work in the workplace? Do we veer off of the way? Jesus said that the way is very narrow, it's very straight, and that we should stick to that path because the end of that path leads to eternal life. There is a way that we should follow. And it's the way of Jesus. Can we say that we are following the faith and we are worshipping in the same mode that our ancestors worshipped, that our foreparents worshipped, those who were believers? I know that in my case, my grandfather on my mother's side was a Baptist minister. So I'm following in his footsteps. I'm following in the way of my ancestors and my forefathers. My mother was and is a devout Christian. Can we say today, like Paul the Apostle, that we follow the way, that we follow the way of our ancestors who worship God and that we firmly believe in the law and the prophets and everything that is written in Scripture, everything that is written in the New Testament? So that's the first point, Paul's confession. And Paul's confession should be our confession. We want to make our confession the same as Paul's confession. Then we move on to verse 15 and we look here at Paul's hope. Paul had a hope and he confessed his hope. I know that we have a hope today that we'll get let out of this quarantine sooner or later. We'll all be able to go back to our normal lives. But beyond that, there is a bigger and deeper hope that we trust and we hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he gave his life for us, that we are saved and that we are redeemed from death uh, by him. And that whatever happens in this life, that Jesus is our assurance. So Paul had a hope and he says in verse 15, I have the same hope in God that these men have, that he will raise both the righteous and the unrighteous. And that's our hope today, that God will raise up the righteous and the unrighteous, that everyone that lived on this planet, doesn't matter how old they are or how young they are, if they die, when they eventually die, that is not the end of their lives. That is not the end of their existence. The Bible says, clearly that God will raise from the dead both the righteous and the unrighteous. Now it's obvious that we do not want to rise as the unrighteous, we want to rise as the righteous. But if we're going to rise as the righteous, then we have to live as the righteous. We have to do right things. We have to do just things. And so uh, this passage is speaking to us, how are we living our lives right now? We can't raise as righteous if we live as unrighteous we have to uh, live as righteous if we want to be raised as righteous and so the scripture is hailing at us how are you living how are you living your life how are we living our lives today are we living as righteous or are we living as unrighteous well you can't live as righteous unless you really read the bible unless you really study the word unless you really look and see what the word has to say and we try to follow that on a daily basis and i think in these times where we're spending more time in the word of god we're spending more time in the presence of god uh we have the opportunity to 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 uh, really knuckle down and get into the deep things of god and so we can be sure that we are definitely living our lives here as the righteous okay so verse 16 uh we've looked at paul's three-part confession verse 15 paul's hope and now in verse 16 we're going to look at paul's practice paul had a practice it wasn't just a hope it wasn't just something that he believed in but he had a practice and what was his practice because of this i always try to maintain a clear conscience before God and all people. What is Paul saying here? 
He's saying, because I want to live as righteous, because I know that God is going to raise up all who, who die, all who fall asleep, some uh, uh, unto everlasting life and some uh, unto everlasting damnation. That's what the Bible teaches. Because of that, I live my life now. I try my best to maintain a clear conscience towards God. But I also try to maintain a clear conscience towards people. You know, some people uh, try to live their lives as though, almost as though um, they are uh, happy to live their lives with a, a clear conscience towards God, but they don't really care what people think. They're not trying to please people in any way, shape or form. They don't give a damn, people say, what people think. But the Bible teaches us that we should care what people think, that we should care um, about what God thinks, but we should also care about what people think. We need to do both. We need to maintain a pure conscience towards God, but we also need to maintain a pure conscience towards man. And we could ask ourselves the question this morning, are we doing that? And in what ways do we need to change what we do or what we say or how we behave to make sure that we are living in good conscience towards God and good conscience towards man? The Bible says, Jesus said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. There are certain things that we should do for our partners, for our wives or for our husbands, certain things that we should do for our children, certain things that we should do for our employers, certain things that we should do for the government, certain things that we should do for the local council. There are certain things that we should do in order to maintain a good conscience. And if we're being troubled, if we things are flying up in our mind right now, we're kind of asking ourselves the question, does it mean that? Does it mean this? Then it, it, you know, it, there's an opportunity there for us to re-examine our lives, re-examine our relationships, and to ask ourselves the question, are we really living our lives according to God's purposes and according to God's order? So we've had Paul's three-part confession, Paul's hope, and Paul's practice. Now the fourth point is really Paul's good works. Verse 17, Paul lays out for us uh, his good works. For after several years away, I returned to Jerusalem with money, with money, with financial resources. Why did he do that? In order to aid my people and to offer sacrifices to God. He wanted to aid his people. Uh, the church in Jerusalem was suffering. They were going through a bit of a famine. They were going through hardship. And so Paul was busy, as we read weeks before, that Paul was busy receiving offerings from the Gentile churches to bring to Jerusalem to help and to aid the church in Jerusalem. And so here he comes with finances and he comes with offerings for sacrifices in the temple to God and he's saying uh, I didn't uh, I wasn't uh, harming the people of of Israel I wasn't insulting the temple I wasn't doing harm to Jerusalem I wasn't doing harm to my people on the contrary I came with finances I bought finances from the Gentiles to help the church and I bought sacrifices so that I could offer to my God and that speaks to us today as well in which ways, in what ways can we bring financial aid to people around us, to people outside of our own home, to other members of the church, to other people who need financial aid and support? In what ways can we do that? It could be some shopping. It could be to help uh, a single parent family. It could be to help a family, a large family with many children who might need a little support from time to time. So we can also do like Paul, we can support others with our finances, we can support the church and the work of the church with our finances. We know that the church needs finances to do what it does and us being here today is a collective of all of our finances coupled together to produce what we have today and to keep the church afloat. But also we must consider what do we give to God as sacrifices. Now uh, for Paul, and the people back then, it may have been offerings of animals and uh, uh, different uh, commodities. Today, our sacrifices, uh, we don't need to sacrifice animals, but our sacrifice can be our praise. We bring a sacrifice of praise. A sacrifice can be, you know, um, uh, abstaining from, from, from worldly pleasures, such as in a time like this. 
Our sacrifices can be giving a certain amount of our time of the day, the first tenth of the, of the day or the first portion of the day to God in prayer and in dedication. Our sacrifices can be to attend the small groups and to be an encouragement to other people within the small groups, to attend the Sunday morning church services and to attend the Tuesday night prayer meetings. We can, all this can be sacrifices to God. Next, we come to Paul's opposition, verse 19. We'll note here that when you're doing God's work, when you're living for Jesus, you will encounter opposition. And Paul encountered opposition here. He said, but some Jews from the province of Asia, there, um, and they, and they ought to be here to bring charges if they have anything against me. So they had sent charges against Paul, but they didn't present themselves in the court to name the charges themselves. And Paul is saying, look, if they want to accuse me, why are they accusing me from afar? Why don't they come close to me? Why don't they come to this council and accuse me here? Ask this men here what crime the Jewish high council found me guilty of because Paul was innocent. At the end of the day, um, he had not committed any wrong. He had not committed any sin. Yes, despite the fact that he had not committed any wrong, despite the fact that he had not committed any sin, he still faced opposition and we should expect that we are going to also face opposition. Opposition when we're doing the right thing. Opposition when we're going about our lives. Opposition when we're trying to preach the gospel. Opposition when we're trying to share our faith. We're going to encounter opposition, but God is with us in the midst of it. If we keep a clear conscience towards God and towards man, God will be in the midst of our trials and our persecution. The final point then in verse 21 is Paul's conclusion. Except for one time, I shouted, I am on trial before you today because I believe in the resurrection of the dead. And that verse uh, actually means more to me now in this situation that we're in than it probably would have meant to me before. The the Lord's Prayer um, means more to me now. I understand it more now in this time than I understood it before. Uh, Psalms 23 means more to me now than it did to me in times when everything was rosy and everything was fine. In these times, these scriptures come alive. And Paul says... Despite all that's going on around me, I believe in the resurrection of the dead. I believe that the saints who have gone before us will rise again into eternal life. I believe that this life is not the be it all and end all, that there is something after this. And I'm living my life because I believe in the resurrection of the dead and I believe that when I die, I will too be resurrected. Jesus promised, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, there you may be also. And so Jesus has prepared a place for us. We can be rest assured that whether we live or whether we die, we are in the hands of the Lord. We're in the hands of the Lord. In fact, the best thing we can do is to live right now as though we are dead. Live right now as though we are dead. What do I mean by that? I often say to people, I'm living now as though I am dead anyway because I'm not living the life I was living before. I'm dying to the flesh daily. The flesh wants to wake up and get alive and start acting in my life every day. But every day I have to crucify him again because I don't want to live as though I'm alive. I want to live as though I'm dead to this world and alive to God. Each and every one of us, under the sound of my voice this morning, ought to be dead to this world and alive to God. When you're dead to this world and alive to God, it changes your priorities, it changes your focus, it changes what you do, it changes how you live, it changes your focus. You might, like Paul, uh, be seen to be a little bit fanatical, a little bit overzealous, a little bit enthusiastic, a little bit intense. But if your hope is in Jesus Christ, and if you have a call on your life, and if you have a mission to fulfill for him, you'll probably come across a little bit like that. Of course, we need to love others in all that we do. We need to be gentle and polite and all the rest of it. But we must be passionate about our faith. We must be passionate about living for Jesus. We must be passionate about sharing the gospel. With that thought now, I'm going to ask us just to bow our heads and pray.
and ask the Lord. Thank you for listening to the message today. We hope it blessed you. And if it did, please like, comment and subscribe for more videos from Micah. And don't forget to click the notification bell to see when they're uploaded. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you in the next one.